Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection terminated. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, the website is pasnia.com. Uh, today I'm joined by Smuggler and Frank Braun, two cypherpunk uh, second-round bu- second builders, uh, folks you should be familiar with, uh, and therefore should need no introduction. But uh, I'll, I'll provide uh, uh, a short introduction anyway, since we are always seeing uh, new viewers and listeners. Uh, Smuggler has been on this podcast twice, episodes 53 and 63, uh, both of which can be located at vonniepodcast.com forward slash 53 and vonniepodcast.com forward slash 63, respectively. And uh, Frank was on here for number 65. Uh, those three podcasts covered, um, I would say, more of the second realm and crypto anarchy fundamentals um, and, I guess, background. And uh, today we're going to uh, expand and adapt those topics uh, for 2021. Uh, and beyond. I should also mention that Smuggler is the co-author of uh, the must-read second-round book on strategy, which uh, is actually available via Liberty Attack Publications uh, if you'd like to snag a paperback copy. Uh, I'll drop a link to that and for the link to read or listen for free. Um, of course, as, as has been the case for any of my stuff over the past seven years um, in the alternative media, nothing will ever be behind a paywall. Um, so, uh, yeah, without further ado, um, Smuggler, Frank, uh, welcome back to the Vonu Podcast, my friends. Uh, how, are we, how are we doing? Uh, how are things uh, across the pond through, uh, well, I guess, all of this? Well, first of all, thank you for having us, and um, things are good, I think. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Um, it's all good here. It's changing times, but we'll adapt. Indeed, indeed, yes, yes. I'm uh, definitely with you, definitely with you. So, so yeah, the, the plan for today, I guess the very loose plan, uh, I uh, don't put much uh, planning into outlines any, or planning into, uh, into episodes anymore, like the free flow discussion sort of uh, sort of thing now. But um, yeah, I'd like to start by uh, getting your eyes' thoughts on Vanu. Uh, Smuggler, I know we talked uh, talked about this real briefly during the Hackers Congress event, um, but I figure my audience here would appreciate your perspective on it. And uh, Frank, same with you. I'm sure plenty would appreciate your insights. If you have any, I mean, uh, I, I, I won't be offended if you uh, haven't dug into it much. Um, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot out there so um yeah if you don't have anything no worries um but uh i guess uh the uh, then the next next i'll turn it over to you guys with a broad question on um building the second realm in this uh, insanely rapidly uh, advancing 2020s uh and uh, we'll go from there so um i guess uh, first off uh what have you guys uh, been up to? I know you're uh, doing the cipher, the uh, Cypherpunk Bitstream podcast. Um, I know there's Scrit Cash, which we we uh, which we talked about last time. I think with both with both of you, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure some other things. So I guess could we start with an update on those projects? And uh, yeah, what's uh, what you guys have uh, been have been doing? And I guess I'll turn it over to you first, Smuggler. Um, not so much public stuff that is ready for the uh, release. So as at least on my side, well, on our side, actually, because it's a shared project. Mm-hmm. We've been coding and working a lot um, on a startup that we're working on, but it's still stealth mode, so we're not talking about it yet. Um, that's basically it. So we've been very busy, but not very publicly busy. Understood. Understood. And Frank, is there anything you'd like to, uh, I guess, to, to mention in, in terms of uh, updates for my audience? Not really. You know, like like someone said, super busy with work and uh, moved to Switzerland. So that sure. was um, also uprooting my life a bit, um, moving here and getting everything organized. So, um, yeah, nothing really to report. Sure, sure. Okay. We're sorry, we're boring, apparently. <laughs> hey, no, no worries. I, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, I can, I can definitely appreciate that. I haven't been doing. Um, I, I thought, um, uh, like when I, when I did more. So when I did, when I had a liberated lifestyle, I do more self liberational media, is what we call it. Like, um, you know, more podcasting and such. But I don't do much like online anymore. Um, like I don't do much publicly. So I, I, I can certainly appreciate. Uh, can certainly appreciate 
appreciate that. Uh, actually, since the, since the last time we spoke, we actually started the bbs.anaplex.net forum. I think that's a new thing we did in wow. 2020. So it's been early 2020, so I forgot about it almost. <laughs> but it's um, it's a little um, web board uh, for cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, agorists, etc. So nice little community, um, high quality. So signal to noise ratio is pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's, that's good to hear. And, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure if, if either of you saw it, but I interviewed uh, Jim Davidson, um, I guess a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and, and he mentioned, um, after, I guess it was after this, after the Somali adventure, I think it was, uh, or it was after the Somali adventure or after something or after another, another one of his ventures. Um, he mentioned the, the Agora, um, Anerplex or the uh, Agora dot IRC chat. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was cool. Yeah. It was, it was a surprising, I guess it wasn't a surprising mention, but I just, I didn't know it's, you, you, you don't ever really know, um, you know, where all the connections are. So, um, I like to hear little, little drops like that. So, um, are you, are you guys know, are you, do you know, Jim familiar with uh, what he's been up to loosely or rather? Oh yeah. 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 I, I actually remember him from the Invisible RC project um, times, uh, so he's been around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. It was uh, it was like um, I, I talked to, um, oh gosh, uh, Wally Conger. Um, if you're uh, more, um, I guess uh, he was. Uh, I, I don't think he knew. I don't think he knew him, but he was around. I guess for, like in the with an agorism in the '80s. Um, so yeah, it's always cool to come across those folks and and Jim Stum who. Um, the uh, main proponent of Vanu, um, Rayo, um, this guy are basically archived all of, all of the like self liberational um, you know magazines uh, zines from basically the 1960s through the 1980s or 90s. So um, I was able to get. Uh, um, he's uh, he's in his he's in his 80s now and he's hard of hearing. So it was a it was a text a text interview. But um, anyway um, anyway um, I guess uh, um, well well uh, I kind of transitioned not transition to this uh, um, transition there uh, a little bit um, smuggler would you mind providing I guess uh, um, give the listeners a little idea of your your, uh, your take on Vanu um, I, I know you mentioned um, I know that there was uh, certainly some overlap with I guess the second realm strategy um, and uh, and mobility when it comes to Vanu so I guess I'll turn it over to you here yeah I mean the the two strategies are are related in a way um, I think the the main difference is that I see second realm more as embedding of communities and not withdrawing that's one difference I would say so what I mean with that is that the the fine line that the second realm strategy is trying to ride is this ability to not completely disconnect from society or not disconnect much from society, but really focusing on spaces that are protected and that are social spaces predominantly. So there, it's not so much about your personal homestead but it's more about the spaces where you come together to um, to meet, to live, to party, to produce, to trade. And that is really the, the focus and that is what, what we've been um, working on and investigating with the TAZ. So it's, it's, um, it's an approach that targets groups and is more thinking about societies and it's more thinking about space. And it is also when it comes to the interaction with the with the state or other opponents, it is more about um, trying to fine tune the conflict uh, in such a way that you can exercise the most of freedom with the least capital investment without being blown up. So it's about fine tuning that relationship there. And as I understand it, Vanu is much more um, hidden is maybe the wrong thing, but it's, it's a way more individualistic, maybe a little more, more disconnected mm -hmm. way of trying to escape the state. 
and we're more about you know being on on the border capturing what we can from from the rest of the society the rest of the market creating spaces that give us the functions that we wouldn't have with the state right. and escaping in that minute barely because before things go south so it's it's more an embedded strategy i would say and in to a certain degree i think that second round tazs and vanu are vanu are um um they're they're additions to each other they're also uh general so they they add to each other and they can coexist to a certain degree right right yeah i i i definitely agree and yeah that's 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 totally that that's def that's definitely a fair analysis um uh Rayo was definitely um Rayo was definitely more of a hermit um he had bad experiences uh, bad bad experiences working with people and, and and yeah i would say the when it comes to vanu it's it's first and foremost self liberation and then um i guess the organizing after that if it comes um back yeah back when Rayo was talking about this back in the 60s and 70s before he disappeared um yeah it was the the he talked about you know ethical enclaves um you know organizing but it was more of a theoretical like you know maybe sometime in the future um so it wasn't the priority um whereas yeah i think and, and that's one thing that really attracts me to the second realm or really attracted me to the second realm idea is that um physical space and time kind of seems like the priority especially from um from the book on strategy and uh yeah. um and and yeah it's it's organizing with with people it's um um yeah for for sure for sure um but i i also do i also do like that there's a there's a there's a similar parallel like I, I, you can definitely see um like the the strategy sort of thinking and that's um so rayo talked about uh um interaction he called it um um he called it um oh gosh why, why can't uh um, he called it import exports um basically trading with the first mm -hmm. uh, trading with the servile society is what he called it so um there's there's still the concept of the first and the second realm um there's the the vanu home the secure vanu home base and the servile society so um i i do like how um both strategies like there's there's very there's very much a lot of overlap in the and overlap in the way the strategies can be applied yeah for sure i, I think that the i think one of the core the difference is, is, is what you mentioned with the um, hermeticism, basically, yeah. and the bad experience with, with other people organizing. And, and I think that's there are, those are fair points because um, organizing with people is actually the hard part. So just hiding, disappearing, being on the road is relatively trivial. But as soon as people get involved, uh, everything becomes more complicated. But on the other hand, when it comes to the strategic outlook, it's groups that survive and individuals that perish. So the ability to cooperate, um, to trade skills, to um, watch each other's back and stuff like that becomes really um, crucial if you are in any kind of conflict. And we're not just talking about the state. I mean, they're, they're, the moment you you leave the environment of the state, it doesn't mean that you leave conflict behind, but right. instead you get other kinds of parasites that you have to deal with. And you can't outsource that anymore. So in, in, in the state environment, we outsource a lot of our problems to the state and we often forget about them. But the moment you leave the state behind, you have to deal with all conflicts yourself. And that makes groups, gangs, teams, brotherhoods, sisterhoods, however you want to call them, um, a key technology to actually thrive. And that is a huge difference. So the, the, a lot of the ideas that led to the second realm actually come from looking at uh, secret societies, criminal societies, um, organized crime etc because they have exactly this problem of being outside the second uh, the first realm in the sense that they cannot rely on whatever services the first realm gives them and they have to deal both with internal institutions infrastructure etc and they have to be able to defend themselves both against the state and against other groups and that is where a lot of the inspiration comes from because it's a relatively realistic 
um, view on what ex what you have to expect when you actually liberate yourself. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, yeah. That's that's a, a great point. I, I recall that uh, the the discussions on uh, on organized crime. Um, yeah, and I and uh, yeah, Kyle meant Kyle mentioned he'd he done a lot more research into this than I had. Uh, my my old co-host of the podcast back when we did that that uh, episode of Building the Second Realm. Um, he mentioned it was. I don't remember what uh, what. Uh, I guess organized criminal syndicate it was, but um, it was funny. They're like, what? One of them banned theft entirely. So it's like, well, shit. If we're comparing like this organized criminal syndicate to the state, well, like this one, autom this one, you know, deems th theft to be immoral. So that's automatically, you know, a leg up. So um, not, not, not saying, you know, not comparing, contrasting. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it was just a funny. Uh, it, it is a good, uh, an interesting one to examine. Um, and yeah, certainly, certainly um, applicable strategy wise too. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Frank, was there anything you wanted to jump in here with? I know you. I, I know you aren't familiar with with Vanu, but um, anything on on what's been mentioned with the second realm so far. So I know you, I know you're familiar with that concept very much, very much so. No, I just uh, I just had this thought uh, when you mentioned the organized crime syndicate that I mean often groups define morality different uh, on the inside than on the outside. So um, yeah, that's fair. You know, some groups. You know, for them, uh, stealing from the outside is fine, but stealing on the inside is not okay. And uh, I think there is some relation to the second round strategy as well. That, um, of course, within groups, you you have uh, often different rules and different loyalties. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, indeed, indeed. So I guess um, there was, uh, um, in in terms of Vani, there's one other uh, one other um, aspect. I, I um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Ray. Ray was an early, early cypherpunk. We talked about it uh, when Max Hillebrand was on the podcast. Uh, we talked about it. So I think he was he was only even said that that Ray was one of the early, you know, one of the earlier cypherpunks. Um, but um, I uh, there's uh, about a page a page from his uh, uh, from his first book, uh, Vaughn of the Church's Personal Freedom, um, that I'd uh, I'd like to read and get your guys' thoughts on. Um, yeah, this would have been uh, July 1973. Um, so, quote, in the future, I expect more and more automa automa automat automatization of word of mouth communication and middleman functions, greatly increasing speed and security at reducing costs. The newer electronic technology integrated circuits is greatly reducing the time and costs of coding and interpreting data. It is also increasing the ability of snoopers to snoop and correlate their findings, but not in, pro not in proportion. For example, a relatively small, cheap device can encipher data beyond the ability of any conceivable computer to break in a thousand years or even to identify as a cipher. And soon, there will be inexpensive radio systems capable of relaying data in ways not traceable by 100 FCCs. Here is how one such system might operate. To buy or sell something, I type or speak an inquiry, order, or offer into my secure communicator, um, SC. My SC enciphers my message and transmits it, transmits it to SCs of a few individuals I know and trust, which in turn they automatically re-encipher and relay it in microseconds to SCs of people they trust, um, etc. In this way, my message can quickly reach the SCs of a very large number of people. Someone who is selling what I'm buying has keyed his SC to watch for messages concerning that product. When my message reaches him, it deciphers and notifies its owner. He and I then converse almost as easily as by telephone telefax, but without having any idea who, who or where the other person is. At this time, we may change our cipher so that our message is no longer intelligible to intermediate SCs which relay it. We come to terms and arrange delivery. If it, is a, uh, if it is a fiscal product, delivery may be made through a drop, but most products will be information in one form or another and can be delivered through the SC net. An example might be a program for my automatic microshaper, which enables it to machine a replacement part for our home flour mill or even parts for a newer and more capable automatic microshaper. While well, a dishonest or unreliable person might join an SC net, he could endanger only his immediate contacts, who made the mistake of trusting him. Anyone who used the net to defraud could be cut out of it. Furthermore, his immediate communicants would be, uh, would be for a time, be considered less reliable. My SC would, uh, could automatically compute the reliability of intermediaries through which a message comes, as well as selecting alternate routes. Propri proprietary data such as a program for my hypothetical automatic microshaper, might be, might be protected from plagiarism by putting individual variations of non-critical dimensions in each part. Payment would most likely be in credits transmitted through the net to an underground bank. Secure communicators and many other Vanu products and activities will be developed and used 
only to the, to the degree that people acquire secure shelter of one form or another, either through outright concealment or by clever deception. SCs can be declared illegal, just as armored cars, firearm silencers, and gold have been. All known abodes and places of business will be subject to inspection just as they are now, and if, it, if an unidentified or unauthorized piece of equipment is found, the blood, will likely, blood police will likely presume that is contraband unless the occupant proves otherwise. Such laws will be difficult to enforce. Um, SCs can be hidden or disguised. Okay, well, I guess that's... Uh, basically the end of it um so that was uh, i guess his conception of a uh, i guess an encrypted radio trade net um back in, in 1973 so um i don't know you guys got any 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 thoughts on on uh, on anything um within there well it's actually fascinating to to listen to that because on the one hand it's visionary and on the other hand it's, it contains all those things that we found out over time are so much harder than we thought. <laughs> so, um, so for example, the, the whole question of trust relationship or um, the question of um, how location resistance, localization resistance, uh, so those systems are, plus um, how to think about those things before the internet was widespread. So it's 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 an actually uh, a pretty fascinating read, um, and it's also fascinating how far we are actually away from that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, it's uh, like Smuggler said. In in a way, the I have the feeling the internet took it over, and we uh, the development on radio networks kind of stalled. Although it would be so much cooler to have a infrastructure that is independent of the internet and uh yeah like like was also mentioned uh, these mesh networks are actually pretty hard if you want to do significant transmission over long distances but um yeah I, I like it a lot it's uh it has some pieces in there which came true in similar forms let's say so um we were still talking about banks but um a lot of these things are are here in one way or the other. Yeah, one point that I find fascinating is this, like in the early NCAP plus cypherpunk uh, days, reputation systems had this this huge uh, weight. So we were thinking like we will we will have reputation networks, and it's um, interesting to see that even today this is like the thing that a lot of people think if if we have reputation networks and finally we will be able to do what we always wanted to do and it's actually the thing that probably doesn't work at all so it's it's quite fascinating to to read that from a um like w when you see those thoughts that are what 50 years old basically mm -hmm. yeah and compare them to where we are today you know it's this mixture of visionary and Naive, you know. That's the I find that fascinating. Yep, yep. That's that's a good way. Yeah, to that's it. right. In some in some areas, in some areas we we came further than we thought, and in other areas we made no progress. Um, the the identity, uh, the reputation systems. I have the feeling it, it's always this idea that we can automate everything out of human relationships. And uh, like Smuggler said, there hasn't been much progress, and it's questionable if there can actually be progress. Um, it's it's still mostly basically person recommendations and uh, just feelings. Yeah. It's not something that is easy to automate. And this other part that I find um, quite interesting is that he has a, a completely different notion on how um, offering and accepting offering um, works in those systems because he, he turns it around from what we have today. So today you would go to a darknet marketplace and search the products for something that fits you. And in his model, uh, uh, model, it is more like you program your thing to wait for an offer that fits you. Mm -hmm. And I actually like his reversed version um, a lot more. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think right now as we're, as we're talking, um, 
how how that would look infrastructure well like, how that would kind of play out um but yeah that's um yeah, and, and I guess that, that kind of that, that kind of speaks to the, the time difference too, because most people nowadays would not put up with that. Like the I guess with the you know the time preference, um, like it would. I, I don't know if, yeah. if I don't know if that would that probably, I don't know if anything like that could actually take off nowadays. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, but if, even with even with folks in the underground, the agora, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if even that time preference would, would be. I, I don't know. Anyway, just a thought. Although it is in reverse, it is still similar to what's happening uh, business on like, let's say WeChat and things like that, where people uh, interact with um, merchant chat robots through True. a messenger. Um, so, so that is actually spot on, except for it being reversed from the, the account flow. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, it, it, you're right. It's, um, I, mean, I was just going through my list of local telegram channels and um, this mixture of um, who needs a haircut and I'm call girl XYZ and um, hey, I have weed to offer. So it's, it's quite fascinating because on, on those networks, you actually have this stream of offers. So the That's only right. it, is, it is actually push based there, right? Yeah, but the only difference really is this, you can't automate yet that your device just passively listens until an offer comes by that you need. It's, it's actually an interesting concept that, that might actually be a, a really good feature. Interesting. Yeah, definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I always, I, I always like, um, especially, you know, July, 1973, um, it sounded, sounded, um, also too, that he was kind of foreshadowing, um, although yeah, like, like he, he talked about computer, he talked about computers in the, in the first paragraph of that excerpt. So I guess it's not surprising. Um, but yeah, payment most likely being credits transmitted through the net to an underground, um, bank, um, obviously not necessarily a bank, but, um, credits transmitted through the net, um. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, de definitely, definitely forward thinking. And there's one other one other quote that um, whenever whenever we kind of wrap up um, this this portion of the conversation, there's one other quote where he's very forward thinking. But um, yeah, you are you are right. There's a very fine line between forward thinking and naive, right? <laughs> well, the the interesting thing is is that you start out as a visionary and you don't know, and nobody else knows what is naive. You only find out the naivety with time. So it's it's not against uh, him. It's right, right, right. you know, in hindsight, this, things become clearer. I mean, maybe I think uh, naivety is the wrong word. I think what we often um, get wrong is the the actual complexity of things. So yeah. that that might be the naive, naive part. That you know, often we think, okay, this is easy, and this other thing is 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 hard, and then it turns out later that the easy part is actually the much harder part. I mean, the, the example I always use for um, encryption is that the encryption is relatively easy, but the whole key management is actually the hard thing. And in the early days, uh, that wasn't really considered. Everybody was thinking about encryption, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, key management was, was thought as of being easy, but that is actually the hard thing. Yeah, it's, it's actually the all those things that have this uh, media change between technology and people that is where where the real complexity comes so as you said uh, key management is one of those things or trust relationship the cyber attacks reputation you know all these places where you have two different kinds of things interacting you know like the the mathematical computer system on the one hand and the person on the other hand and that mapping the one to the other and, and, and in reverse, that is where things get surprisingly complicated. Yeah. Once the wetware gets involved, things get messy. Exactly. <laughs> Understood. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I, I, I certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate all of that, uh, all of that, uh, that insight. um, certainly further than we've gone before on that. Um, but yeah, Kyle and I are definitely not, we uh we aren't uh, this deep into the into the technology so yeah i, I certainly uh, certainly appreciate that was there anything else in regards to his uh, secure communicators um encryption scheme or um or anything else you guys like to to mention before before i uh um just before i read this this last very short quote i think i would like to emphasize what frank said with the messengers um i, I think that for 
a certain amount of time, we thought that the way we should do stuff is like um, build websites or build darknet websites or boards or whatever. And it's this fascinating thing that both from a communication standpoint and from a like a social communication standpoint and from a technical standpoint, we we're actually going much closer back to the old marketplaces. You know, when, when you when you think about the the marketplace in in a medieval city, you know, where you have the merchants uh, shouting what kinds of products they have to offer, uh, and that is their advertisement. So just coming to the place and then listening to the advertisement that they shout is is how um, this whole finding each other works, and and that is essentially what we're coming back to with um, messengers with stuff like drop gangs, stuff like um, local beacons, etc. So it's actually quite fascinating that this whole interlude of the web where as um, cypherpunks and agorists, we we dabbled around, but in a, in a way, those non-ideological market players actually innovated past us. And they're, you know, they have no idea about encryption or anything, but they're running their drug empires on Telegram. So I, I find that um, important to emphasize that that is actually the direction in which a lot of things seem to be evolving. That that is that is true. That and that is true. An interesting point. Um, there, there's I, I saw I saw um, a couple a couple I've seen a couple people selling um, like mushrooms and cannabis. Um, on Twitter, um, through like an Etsy shop, they just change the names on the stuff. So like, I, I guess yeah, it, 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 things are kind of just getting more overt out in the public. Um, and yeah, same with the, the tele, the, yeah, the telegram is certainly interesting. I, I dump most, like all, which I should have done a long time ago. And I know you guys are already long, long there, but, um, yeah, I dumped, uh, I've, I dumped mo all of the centralized social media platforms, except for Twitter at this point, um, or all the censorship, um, happy ones. I think floats still center, still centralized, but whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that the censorship happy ones, um, and and yeah, I'm kind of you know, moving mostly over to Telegram at this point. Um, at least kind of kind of the answer. I mean, that's where a lot of folks are going, um, and that's I guess one thing I've one, I guess one 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 thing I've kind of noticed over the past um, over the past year, which which we'll get into. Um, but I wanted to um, I wanted to read this this last quote by Rayo, and then get get more into kind of the um, the progression into the into I guess twenty twenty twenties and twenty twenty one with with building second realms. And I think this really sets the stage because um, it's what we're facing, and it harkens back to again the forward thinking of uh, forward thinking nature of Rayo. But um, he said, "quote I want a lifestyle which can easily withstand the worst technocratic super totalitarianism that is within the realm of reasonable possibility." We may still have some contact with that society, but we won't have to worry appreciably over what idiotic thing the people molesters do next, any more than somebody who takes a vacation at the Riviera now and then needs to be much concerned about the politics of France. Our change in lifestyle will be, in a sense, an answer to the omnipotence of state line of Rothbard and Hess. We'll answer not in words, but by doing the only real way. Um, so, I, I love the quote just in general, but he's t talking about the technocracy, and that's kind of what we, what we, what we saw um, really, really speed up um, in 2020. But again, like it's something he foresaw. It's uh, uh, you know, it's something that very early cypherpunks back in you know, as soon as computers, as soon as te this technology came out, um, you could automatically kind of see the uh, people could automatically see the, the what could happen and and the importance of privacy and encryption. And that's kind of my understanding of the history. So, um, I suppose. Um, I, I yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll give you a chance to to each stand, each answer however however you wish. But uh, can you provide uh, I guess uh, I guess just uh, an overview of um, your I guess your your thoughts on um, 2019 2020 and um, I guess just the um, the the advancing technocracy and and how it relates to the the um, how it, how your strategies updated any. And uh, smuggler or Frank? <laughs> smuggler, you go ahead. No, no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've I found it highly interesting in the last year. I mean, uh, with with the whole COVID thing, so many things changed at once and and got accelerated. So I'm I'm still kind of like in the process of. Um, 
trying to understand it all. Um, there, there are so many loose ends to to uh, try to get together. You know, like for example, the whole remote remote work thing got accelerated massively. You know, suddenly everybody everybody's online, so um, that that sped up so many things uh, that that I found really interesting. What I found also extremely uh, illuminating was that um, I think there was no year like uh, last year that showed me as much how uh, people are live, living in completely different realities. I mean, that's what you could see with COVID and what you could also see with the whole US election thing. I mean, it's almost if, if people are living in different countries, you know. Um, which might be related to people just being, you know, um, online all the time, and everybody's kind of like in their own uh, bubble, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, in terms of strategy, I think it's um, it's it's quite challenging, you know. For for us, the we we did some meetups, and I think mostly. 2019 and then that all came to like a grinding halt in 2020 and uh so we still kind of trying to figure out how to um how to meet in the physical you know how to do it online um it's definitely more challenging to build any physical community in these times yeah yeah that, that that's a good point it's 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 really just uh it, it really just progressed very very rapidly and and uh, as i said in a previous podcast like it's things really haven't changed much it's just more more of the human experience has been forced into i guess maybe the gray area or the gray markets i guess you could say um where it could be um depending on the number of people or depending on where you're doing it or depending on what arbitrary you know rules and regulations are you know in effect wherever someone happens to find themselves um you know it could be it could be illegal or gray mark you know gray area or, or whatever so yeah you're you're right yeah, you're, you're definitely right um smuggler did you have anything well a, a couple of things to add to what frank said about physical meetings the interesting thing, if you have a situation like this, especially when you have polarized views and reality, is that physical meetings often reflect those different positions and lead to conflict, where a lot of our liberty-minded um, friends basically break the ability of cooperation by simply trying to make whatever point they want to make about politics, basically, like the politics of the pandemic and whatever. So that's an interesting area of, of conflict, actually. And it's so for me, 2020 was really this year where I thought a lot about our ability as freedom loving people to actually have sensible communities that survive stress. And I've been rather disappointed with that. So I've been disappointed with humanity in general, and I've been disappointed with the liberty lovers in specific. So there's a, a whole field where I personally really have to to do a lot of thinking and processing and and trying to figure out how we are not undermined by external factors, but actually really learn to be independent and constructive in our own thoughts and methods. So, for example, for for our community here, it has taken too long until we really caught up with sensible ways of dealing with the with the situation, both when it comes to finding this fine line between um, visibly breaking the lockdown rules or just covertly uh, breaking the lockdown rules, um, how to do that in a way that minimizes risk, um, but still allows us to do what we want to do. Um, then the, the whole question of uh, protecting each other, like how far do you have to go? Where do you um, take a back seat just 
you know, to accommodate other people. So this whole calculation of how to actually deal with groups of people that have very different opinions on the one hand, on the, on the other hand, really have no true capacity of really uh, operating socially. And I mean, this, this lack of capacity to operate socially, something you really only see in conflict. And that has been uh, quite visible for me. So that's a big, big thing. Um, and I, I don't know what to do with that yet. So as I said, I'm, I'm uh, actually quite, dis quite disappointed with, with us. Um, the other thing to mention when it comes back to the quote is that I think we have not at all seen what technocratic tyranny can be. And that's another point that, that really disappointed me the last year is this everybody freaking out about some minor rules and thinking that they're living in a, in a dystopia where nothing is possible anymore. And everybody who tried, however, was able to circumvent those rules, um, go deeper underground, just break them, or just discover that those rules are only on paper and not enforced. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I found this, this overreaction um, and this, let's call it dystopia LARPing. I found that really bad. So I was, I was, I'm still really pissed at a lot of people, like how they reacted to it. So like for all your life, you're, you're living with paying taxes and you're not complaining about it anymore, but now somebody wants a PCR test and you think that you're living in dystopia. We we've been living in the dystopia before that you just got used to it. And now suddenly a minor thing is the worst thing that could ever happen. It's, you know, I, I found this shift in, in how to weigh things. I found that dramatically, um, almost juvenile, but it, it's destructive. It's destructive in a deep sense, because you could see that we ourselves are really disconnected from reality. And we have been disconnected from reality so much that it, the situation now reveals of how much that has happened before is really, really just pretending, you know, how much pretend we did in, oh yeah, I'm going to be free now. But for most people, that was just, um, it, it's almost like virtue signaling, you know, you virtue signal, oh yeah, I have crypto and now I'm a libertarian or a free person or whatever. But in reality, a lot of that is just bullshit. And I, I've been, I've been really, hmm. I don't know. I'm, I, I haven't processed, uh, 2020 and the reactions of the community yet, um, quite frankly. And I am fearful in a sense that what would happen if things really hit the fan, you know, like shit fan problem like we we have seen nothing yet and we're all already um completely failing what's going to happen if things get really hard what then what do you mean with yeah we haven't seen nothing yet well when it comes to to technocratic tyranny you know most things today we can easily circumvent or we don't really depend on so it's not really we're not living in a in a deep dystopian tyranny right now. There are people that did that in the past, you know, like Soviet Russia, you know, um, North Korea, blah blah blah. That's they have real issues, and they are able to circumvent and live anyways, or were mm -hmm. able to circumvent and live anyways. And now it becomes slightly harder, and people freak out instead of finding solutions that was something that for me was scary you know this this failure of so many of us and i include myself to a certain degree so many of us to cool-headedly um breaking the tyranny 
you know, and instead actually like incorporating it and, and becoming it mostly like um, people just pretended that there was a big thing out there. But on the other hand, they actually believed it. You know, I, it's hard to, 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 to vocalize, but it's this, this lack of seriousness and understanding what's going on that that was for me that was shocking well, well for me it's um for me it's um there's some echo there um for, for me it's really what i realized is um before i thought like people they are liberty lovers, you know, they, they want to um, live outside, let's say, of the system. They don't want to be under the um, influence of the system. That, that That's what, you know, got me um, excited about liberty or what excites me about liberty is that you try to be independent from the system. And what I realized last year is that as a lot of people, I have the feeling it's not about liberty. It's about... Um, being against the system it's it's still in a way their identity is totally defined by the system the only difference is instead of you know being for it they are against it and that leads to these you know knee-jerk reactions where people um basically are always against something just because the system says it says you know this is how we do things now and and it leads to this like really weird conclusions in my opinion you know um yeah basically think... you know some some state measure is wrong and therefore there is no virus simplified but that, that often seems to be like the uh, the reasoning there and it almost becomes fashionable to be uh, a covid denier when you're libertarian because the state does some stupid shit yeah, I, I, I was often reminded of what uh, Paul Rosenberg is often saying is this, you have to think about what you would do if you were actually free, like if you have nothing to fight against anymore, how would your life look like? Right. And what I meant with this LARPing is that it seems that a lot of people are just in the scene to, to draw their identity from being against the system and without actually having a vision of the where they want to go and with constantly um, making up this or, or presenting this polarity between them and the system and instead of being you know forward oriented being constructive etc it's they're more a commentary on the current system than innovators for the future system mm -hmm. And that the problem is that if we are ever more successful sooner or later, if their, if their identity is based on this negation of whatever is there, they will become the negation of us. And sooner or later, it's going to be the same mindset that is going to disrupt and subvert in whatever we are doing. So, if you're just against what is the majority or whatever, then the moment freedom actually wins in a considerable way, the same mindset will destroy it again. Sure. Yeah. You mean because people are then against that? Exactly. Be because they have to differentiate them themselves and they differentiate themselves by being against whatever is currently working. And that is what I meant with this. Um, you haven't been against the dystopia we've already been living in. You know, if, if you really think that liberty is a, is a great thing, then that was always true. Right. And then you're working towards a vision that is actually positive. You know, you have a, a concept of this is how it is and not a concept of this is not how it is. And I actually think that there's a there's at least one reason for that that is our fault, like our fault in the sense of libertarian thinkers and whatever. And um, for me, it's this 
or one of the signs is this when we're talking about the state when we're talking about bureaucrats and whatever we dehumanize it so we're talking about you know the servile society we're talking about the blotches we're talking about the monsters whatever and in a way that is actually wrong because the instead of saying how we will be better we're just focusing our negativity on them and that basically yeah. captures is this relationship with being against those monsters instead of liberating us towards saying we know how to do it better you know we we know how to progress ourselves and our friends and our families and our societies and maybe even humanity towards something actually fundamentally better in itself instead of just being bashing the police i mean why the fuck bash the police if you can ignore it i want to be able to ignore the police and not think about it anymore mm -hmm. yeah yeah you may you make a good well you made a lot of good points there but um the 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 one that i, I think you you guys both both kind of uh, are, are pointing out is that the people who cared about freedom um were already working towards solutions before 2020 right um there are people that were that already saw enough value in freedom and liberty that they're were, they're were making sacrifices or they were they were building or, or whatever um you know building um building solutions and, and and the furtherance of it so um i i think the the, the one thing i will say though is that um, what I what I did see over the course of 2020 is that the, the people who just needed that last little nudge in the direction of solutions, um, there's uh, there there were there there's been some there's there's definitely been an, um, an increase in increase in folks. Um, um, definitely an increase in folks looking to organize, you know, locally and, and building the agora, building second realms, things like that. So I, I think that's uh, that's certainly a positive. Um, but yeah, it's it's not uh, it's it's not uh, you know a huge number of people um, and. Uh, yeah, there there are um, a lot of folks still just 100% focused on um, on the problems, on the problems in the first realm, um, and yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's not uh, that's not going to uh, to build something positive. Yeah, you're, you're you're certainly correct about that. Yeah, I would like to add to that because um, I think that's another mistake we often do, and that is where looking at our ideological compatriots and look at what they do instead of looking at what the normies without the philosophical background and whatever do because that is the thing that i really liked is that a lot of people without saying i'm libertarian i read rothbard or whatever they just um recaptured their lives to a certain degree True. I mean, yeah, all that, those that's, that's that's true. I, I am seeing more. I am seeing more just like families that are um, like I, I've seen a couple families pop into the Paznia chat, for example. So yeah, more generally outside libertarian circles, just folks that are that's just folks that's yeah, just just yeah, just local, you know, just local normal people. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of that going on. So it's it's actually fascinating to see how people at a certain point just break the rules. So underground haircuts of course is, is a big thing then underground parties and clubs um right. so for example in berlin there were several nightclubs like um dance clubs that have been raided that were like hidden in basements behind uh vending machines and stuff like that so i, I found that not, not the raiding of course but the existence of those things is an aspect of great hope or the other aspect is this um, big trade in falsified PCR uh, test certificates. So where a lot of people are trading those immunity certificates, um, then there's a black market in vaccinations, vaccination certificates, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not talking from health politics here, just the, the amount of um, black market activity in the last year has dramatically increased for whole new sections of society. I think that's because um, for many people, things got to a point where there literally was no other way anymore to um, to keep, you know, earning a living and just surviving. So they they got pushed past the breaking point. 
Th that is part of it, I think. But the interesting thing is that a lot of those people that could push were pushed past this breaking point and then started to be black market active. They also inspired others, because what is clearly to be seen is that enforcement cannot keep um, it, it cannot keep up with the the amount of rule breaking now. So people learn that, and they see that them breaking the rules is actually a viable option, even if they're not really forced towards it. Mm. So you have those trailblazers that were pushed into it, and then they're followed up by a lot of people that see that it works. And it would be an interesting thing to think about how to keep this momentum going. Because quite frankly, if what is going on right now on, on the black market, if we can um keep that alive that might actually break a lot of states like in our lifetime like in the next few years mm. yeah that's that's fair and and i guess it, it, and i i um as i said a little little bit ago that it's like it's 2020 really just pushed some additional things into you know the black and gray markets um it's um, yeah, even, uh, even it's, it's to the point now, like, uh, with, uh, um, there's, uh, and, and whether, how much of it is fear monger, uh, how, how much of it is fear mongering, how much of it is, is actually, um, real is, you know, there's a hard, it's kind of a hard, hard line to, you know, figure out there sometimes, but, um, you know, there, there are problems with, you know, the centralized food supply, um, here in, here in the States. So, um, yeah, even, even things like, even, even, you know, things like that, uh, you know, might, might, uh, um, uh, you know, might might get pushed into with with all the the nonsense regulations and such for for meat and dairy and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's just more more areas of the human experience being pushed into the black and gray markets. And um, and yeah, there, there's there's certainly there, it's it's certainly great to acknowledge. And this is why I always appreciate talking to talking to you, Smuggler, and, and also you, Frank, is that you guys are very you're very real um, and honest about you know, your perspective on things. And um, yeah, just. Uh, um, yeah, but um, so so yeah, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. I I, I definitely do. Um, but yeah, there, there's certainly there's certainly um some positive there's certainly some positives. As I said, um um smuggler, we were talking um pre-show about about how I got the first event coming up at Pasnia here um in March, and it's just an unofficial. If it's not even Vanu Fest two, um the actual real event happening at the end of the year. It's just this this thing I tossed out in a and and tossed out to some folks, and and there's gonna be fifteen or twenty people um coming out here. Um, so like there's, there's still like, uh, in, in, in terms of, um, there's also the freedom cells website here in the state. Well, I guess it's, it's worldwide. Um, but there's, 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 there's some good, there's some really, really good things happening. Um, and, and I want to make sure to, to acknowledge that and highlight that. Um, but also at, uh, but also, um, yes, um, all of the things you guys are pointing out are, are, are critically important and I'm, I'm happy you're, you're, you're doing so. Yeah, uh, it's it's actually interesting to to watch the United States from afar um, these days, <laughs> because um, for the last I don't know ten years, fifteen years, I was really disappointed with the liberty scene in in the U.S. and Same. now it's picking up again. So I'm really happy about that. Sure, they also got pushed past the breaking point. Soon the sessions will start. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 going to be interesting. Uh, it's it's going to be really interesting. There's there's a lot of uh, things are in a position politically where, um, and I don't care about the political saying, but just the the nature, just the the, the political situation itself. Um, you know, like something has to, ch so, you know, something some some things have to change, and I, it's just going to be interesting to see. Um, interesting and exciting to see where where everything uh, kind of uh, kind of plays out. Um, so I've got uh, just a, a couple of uh, miscellaneous questions. One, one from somebody on Twitter, but I, I want to give you guys a chance. Uh, I've been going for an hour here, about an hour here, and I want to make sure to, to work on these last couple of questions. Um, with it, was there uh, anything else you guys wanted to to talk about um, on uh, in the realm of what we've been covering so far? Developments, recent developments. I'm and good. Such? I'm good. Okay. I'm good too. Okay. Very good. So, um, just one one thing that uh, that's uh, um, and it's a very it's a, another very pressing thing. It's something we talked about on this podcast before, but uh, it's a very very uh, rapidly advancing um, area. So, um, it's kind of an area where you guys have some expertise in. So, um, 
do you guys have any current recommendations or I guess um, suggestions on things to look into for um, privacy in the realm of uh, in, the, in the realm of cell phones um, in the modern day um, like projects uh, there's uh, I know there's pine phone out there and there's some other ones there's some other operating systems you can put on Androids and such um, but is there anything that you guys are particularly interested in um, that's out there and available right now yeah I actually recommend uh, to most people to get a phone with graphene OS on it and then just get an external um, LTE to Wi-Fi router or GSM or 5G to, to, to Wi-Fi router. So you basically have those two devices. You have your hardened graphene phone, but you don't have a SIM card in it. And you just connect to it via Wi-Fi to your portable um, router. And then, I mean, nobody uses the, the cell phone network for calls anyways. I mean, you're right. using Signal or Telegram or whatever uh, makes your, your uh, boat float. So um, and the reason is that it's much easier to replace those uh, little portable routers. And you can swap them out to uh, hide your, your network fingerprint. So it's not a big problem to have like three, four, five of them and then use them specific to what what your activity is right now. Um, and since you don't want anybody to know that those activities are connected, you're switching out the the router, the mobile router, and um, then you have your graphene phone, which is a little bit more hardened and has not Google on it. Uh, Google services aren't on it. And you can still have most of your communications um, um, apps and you can have your your navigation your web browser and stuff like that so i think that's that's actually very close to the ideal um, solution I'm, I'm not a huge fan of stuff like the pine phone or the libram because they're both their hardware and, and, and software stack are um far away from being everyday usable by normal people. Mm. So I, I think that graphene is, is really the way to go for, for right now. And for those of you that are more technically inclined, um, I always recommend putting Termox in there, which is a, a Linux shell. So you're able to run your command line programs and your SSH and whatever uh, from the command line on your, on your, um, on your phone so um that's that's basically all you need today uh, I, I think that the the pine phone librem and what else is out, out there they will need quite some time to to really be usable and secure enough because right now their their security is not up, uh, up to par um, mm -hmm. at all yet gotcha that's fair frank do you have uh, anything you'd like to, to offer any insight no, I agree with Smuggler. I think Graphene is probably the best you can do right now in terms of mobile operating systems. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, that, that and, seems... And uh, the separation, I mean, maybe... Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Maybe to add that uh, that the separation, like what Smuggler said, it, it allows you to swap it out more easily, but it also means that you have your baseband processor separated from the uh, operating system of your mobile phone. So that's also a security advantage there. Because the, the baseband processor that actually does the data traffic uh, has its own operating system, which is proprietary and has control over the entire system. And if you have that running on the phone, then um, you don't really have much device security there. So that's another advantage. Uh, so is that kind of like the management engine um, that's uh, removed from, I guess, the open source, more open source privacy friendly laptops then? Is that the, man the management engine of the, of the phones? Yeah, metaphorically speaking, metaphorically, yes, but it's yeah. it's more of like the yeah the operating system of the baseband processor, and it's mm -hmm. usually closed source, and uh, but it has all the capabilities. Yeah, in that sense, it's similar to the management engine, sure. and that's why you don't really want to use it on a phone. So ideally, I don't know, Smuggler, do you know if there is some uh, device that doesn't have that for Graphene OS, like a pure um, Wi-Fi based device? No, there isn't. And the problem is that they're on the same chip, so you can't really switch them off. But the graphene is actually doing a lot of work in, in isolating the management, uh, the basement processor from the application processor. So 
um, the, the main issue in, in that realm is really uh, tracking. And if, you, if you're really hardcore, you can actually do Ethernet, USB, uh, Ethernet over USB to your router so you don't even have a Wi-Fi footprint. So that's for the pros. Mm. Uh, so smart people are working on it then. That's what I like to hear. Um, people smarter than myself, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, so the the um, last question I'll, I'll pause it here was uh, one mentioned on Twitter, and I think uh, some folks will be interested in this one for sure. Um, please could you ask uh, their thoughts on X, uh, Monero versus Bitcoin? Um, do you hold the commonly held view that Bitcoin is a better store of value, which you can then swap for uh, Monero to make private purchases? Or do you see the f a future in which Monero holders won't want to trade uh, Monero for tainted Bitcoin and then Monero becomes the best store of value? Or does the worse audibility um, of the supply and or regular hard forking of Monero prevent this? So, um, yeah, Monero versus Bitcoin and uh, basically do the advantages of do the disadvantages of Monero um, outweigh the disadvantages of Bitcoin. So I guess I'll, I'll toss it over. Um, I'm not sure which, which one of you want to, which one of you wants to take this one? Maybe let me start. Um, so I think privacy wise, Monero is definitely the better system just because it's uh, on by default. And, uh, in, you know, every, every transaction is, is way more private than Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin, you have to do mixing and that's becoming more and more expensive with, um, with the increasing transaction fees. Um, in, in terms of store value, I think right now Bitcoin has the upper hand there. And in a way that is kind of disappointing because, um, to me, it shows that the, the market doesn't really value privacy that much. I think that is the reason why, why Bitcoin is winning in terms of um, store value there. You know, there's a lot of, you know, institutional money coming in, companies coming in who I actually think it's a great feature of Bitcoin that you can audit everything right. and it's traceable because it brings it closer to, you know, regulatory compliance and these things. And, and that's probably the, in terms of uh, store value, that's probably the biggest um, risk for Monero is that it's going to get delisted or it might get delisted from exchanges. Some already did that and that we will see this, this split in a way between privacy coins who will be fought with, you know, regulation and kicked off the exchanges. And that of course, you know, um, damages price discovery, it makes it harder to trade. And then the traceable coins like Bitcoin will, will stay on exchanges. So in, in terms of pure speculation, um, it's probably um, best to, or like um, profit, most profitable to stay in Bitcoin. And in terms of privacy, um, Monero is, is pretty high up my list, but there are a few other coins which are also interesting, so. Very interesting. Smuggler, you got it. Well, since I'm the um, cryptocurrency skeptic in this round, um, <laughs> I, I would just like to remind people that whatever you put your eggs in shouldn't be one basket. So distribute widely and not only cryptocurrencies. There are bullets, there's canned food and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's a store of value as well. Optimist by crypto, pessimist by cans. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would also um, diversify within crypto and definitely outside crypto. I, I think it's a good idea to get some physical gold and uh, also the good old cans and bullets never hurt. Yep. 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 That's what we're doing here at Pasnia, raising raising lambs and and goats. Um, and I have plenty of plenty of meat and a lot of whey. Like I've, I'm gonna have three three milk producing animals this spring. I've already got two, so I'm gonna be making lots lots of whey protein to store away. So, um, yeah, that's gonna be my 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 focus here, um, outside of crypto. But cool. um, pe other people are are obviously free to do whatever whatever um, whatever they like. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I certainly appreciate you guys coming on. That was a, a yeah fan, fantastic conversation. I guess I'll I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys one more time. Um, any uh, any other closing thoughts you'd like to uh, to leave the audience with? And uh, Frank, I'll turn it over to you first, my friend. 
Um, no, I think we covered it all. It was, was great talking to you. Great. great. My last words, uh, just rock on, don't give up. The future will be awesome. Yes, sir. I'm with you. Definitely with you. Definitely with you. Well, um, guys, thank you so much. Um, is there uh, do you want to uh, plug plug your guys' podcast uh, for for the audience? Let them know where they can they can find it. And if you got anything interesting uh, in store, and it will obviously be interesting stuff coming up. But anything you'd like to mention in, in, in regards to it? Yeah, of course. So uh, our podcast is Cypherpunk Bitstream. You can find it on taz0.org. And the web forum that I mentioned is on bbs.anaplex.net. And on anaplex.net, you also find um, crypto anarchist writing. You also find that on opaque.link. And Frank has a good website as well. You know the URL better than I do. Yeah, the URL of my website is frankbraun.org. And in regards to Cypherpunk Bitstream, the next episode is going to be released soon and it's on non-compliance which i find mm. kind of fitting for an, our conversation today so for sure for sure well um for uh, for the folks over here vanu definitely go uh, check that out if you haven't already um i know i know much of my audience has already has has mentioned it to me mentioned it to me before so um i know uh, our, our audience is definitely uh, definitely overlapped to uh, to a significant degree um but uh yeah guys I, I i certainly appreciate you coming on we'll have to get you back on in the near future and um yeah appreciate it Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hey, not a problem. All right, guys. And uh, there you have it. Uh, Smuggler and Frank Braun, two cypherpunks and second realm builders um, over across the pond. Uh, if you'd like more on the second realm strategy, uh, please do visit vonnypodcast.com forward slash second realm clips uh, for all of the essential links, uh, all the essential links, the reading, uh, as well as the episode list uh, for our building the second realm series. Uh, I know I've been promoting it a lot, but it's important and it's not that much of an investment of time. And uh, over the course of the, of the dozen or so episodes, you'll basically hear the entire book Smuggler um, co-author. So um, yeah, get two birds stoned at once, as I, uh, as I like to say. Um, and yeah, please check out our partners over at Liberty Attack Publications, uh, libertyattack.com. We offer books on freedom strategy, libertarian philosophy, anarchist uh, fiction, discounted bundles, privacy tools. We'll, we'll have privacy tools coming um, and, uh, and more. Uh, again, uh, the website's libertarianattack.com. And uh, you can also find uh, publishing information. If, you, if you're looking for a, uh, a freedom-minded publisher, we can uh, help you uh, share your story. Um, and the website for this podcast is vonnypodcast.com. Um, that is and uh, will always be the best place to go for everything Vonu. Um, it is the uh, place where we 100% control. So um, definitely the place to go. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. And always remember, Vonu is yours for the making. Thanks, guys. See you. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon. Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection terminated.